Hi, I'm Laura Stewart from the Reading League. Welcome to Teaching, Reading, and Learning, the TRL podcast. The focus of this podcast is to elevate important conversations in the educational community in order to inspire, inform, and celebrate contributions to teaching and learning. On today's podcast, you will love hearing from APM reporter Emily Hanford. Um, I really wish this session could have gone on and on. She has so many terrific insights, and I know many of you probably follow Emily's work. Uh, however, in today's podcast, you're going to learn a little bit more about Emily and how where she started out isn't necessarily where she ended up. So I know you will really appreciate this episode. Thanks for tuning in and enjoy. Our guest today is Emily Hanford. To give you a little background from Emily, Emily is a senior education correspondent at APM Reports, the documentary and investigative reporting team at American Public Media. She has been working in public media for more than two decades as a reporter, producer, editor, news director, and program host. She has written and produced content for many news outlets, including NPR, The New York Times, The Atlantic, The Washington Post, Los Angeles Times, Washington Monthly, and PBS NewsHour. Her work has won numerous awards, including a DuPont Columbia Award, a Casey Medal, and awards from American Education Writers Association and the Associated Press. In 2017, Emily won the Excellence in Media Reporting on Education Research Award from the American Educational Research Association. She is a frequent speaker and moderator. Emily has been at American Public Media since 2008, where she produces education documentaries that air on public radio stations nationwide. It can also be heard on the Educate podcast. She produced Hard Words, Why Aren't Kids Being Taught to Read in 2018, At a Loss for Words, How a Flawed Idea is Teaching Millions of Kids to Be Poor Readers in 2019, and her latest report, What the Words Say, in August of this year. And I think I speak for many of us in the science of reading community when I say that I am deeply grateful to Emily for really elevating the conversations around reading education and educational equity in this country. So welcome, Emily. Hi. Thanks for having me, Laura. Yeah, it's great to have you here. So um, one of the things I thought we would do um, is just really kind of dig into your origins and the impact of your work. So let's, let's kind of start there. Um, just tell us about yourself as a reader. You know, how did you learn to read and has reading always been important in your life? So how did I learn to read? You know, I kind of distrust when people tell me with certainty how they learn to read because I'm not sure anyone really knows. Um, so I don't really know how I learned to read. Um, I think that I am one of those people that reading came pretty easily for. We know that there's a chunk of us, maybe half of us, maybe not quite that many, where we're gonna learn to read um, pretty much no matter what, as long as we are read to and we get a little bit of instruction and we have a lot of opportunity and we do a lot of figuring it out on our own. And, and we do know that once kids get started, a lot of what we learn about language and reading is through reading. It's just this question of how do you start? <laughs> so, you know, I, I, so I, I have memories of, of uh, reading in school we had, we had color, I actually I haven't been able to identify what system it was. I remember really wanting to get to the purple. They were, they were by colors. Purple was my favorite color. I was a good reader in school. You know, I was one of those kids that was like on one of the high levels and I was very proud of that. And reading was really important to me. I read a lot when I was a little kid. Um, and I had a wonderful first and second grade teacher. It was the 1970s. It was definitely an era where a lot of sort of, um, sort of progressive kinds of ideas were coming into education. It was very like play-based. I have wonderful memories of play in kindergarten and first and second grade, <clears throat> and not a lot of memories of explicit instruction. Yeah, you know, it's interesting you mentioned that, uh, that system with the colors because I remember that too. And I always was, you know, in a hurry to kind of get to the highest level. And, you know, when you mention some of us don't necessarily remember, you know, how we learn to read, um, I think a lot of teachers have that going on. And so for them, they think, well, you know, reading came easily for me. Um, I think a lot of teachers, you know, they want to become a teacher because they were good at school and they were good at school because they love to read. Um, so many times we don't necessarily remember receiving explicit instructions. So sometimes we don't think, well, 
that's absolutely necessary? You know, do you, have you found that in your, in your speaking with other? Absolutely. Educators? And the thing that I want to say is I think I may have gotten explicit instruction. I don't remember it. Um, I de definitely remember like decodable readers. I don't remember if I got those in school or if I had them at home. I think I did. You know, I definitely remember like the cat sat on the mat and tin, you know, the tin pan. I mean, I remember those books and I remember, I do have memories of how exciting it was to be able to read those words. Um, yeah, and I do, I mean, I think my experience in my years as a reporter, I mean, this is a broad generalization, but I think a lot of people go into teaching because they have a strong feeling about their own school experience, sometimes one way or the other. So for some people, it's because school really was a great experience for them. And for some people, it's because it wasn't. And they go to school, they, they become a teacher very much for that reason. Um, but I always very much liked school. And, you know, I think I, 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 I was from, I, I grew up in a, a, a fairly affluent community, but I grew up on sort of like the working class side of town. And I was very aware of class differences and race differences early on. Um, there was a, I grew up in the Boston area and there's a very famous integration program that's still going on called the Metco program. And I remember very much, we were a fairly white town and that was how integration was achieved in our town. And I, 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 re I remember having an awareness early on that I had a lot of privilege and advantages um, and that, that, that I was seen as a smart kid but I had an awareness that that might not really be true, that I was, I was a kid who just had a lot of ways to like be the smart kid. Ah, uh, yeah, know? interesting, interesting. So did that, did that color your, um, your decision to go into reporting and journalism and especially education? Um, tell us about, tell us a little bit about how that I ended up came. where I am. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it wasn't a plan. Oh, okay. um, in fact, so, so what happened actually is I, I went to college and I just was getting a bachelor's degree. I had absolutely no idea what I wanted to do with my life. I really didn't. And um, I actually left college for that reason. Um, I had always been kind of a good student. And as graduating from college grew closer, I sort of had a reckoning with like, I don't know what else to do or be besides be a good student. I've been a good student for so long. So I left college with one semester left. I had, I was in my, the end of my first semester of my senior year. And it was one of the best decisions I ever made. I wish I had done it a little bit earlier. Um, I just went home. I lived with my mom. I, I worked at a bookstore. I did a ton of reading. I just sort of read about so many different things. I was able to borrow books from the bookstore, novels and bestsellers and, and nonfiction and research and all kinds of stuff. And then I went back to college, still without really knowing what I wanted to do. And I took a, I took a writing class, a nonfiction um, narrative writing class. And I ended up getting connected with the local public radio station in the college town where I went to school. And I started uh, working there as an intern. And I've just been in public radio ever since. So I came to this whole journalism thing just through becoming a public radio reporter and have covered lots of different topics. The very first story I did was about like flooding in Western Massachusetts back in 1993. Um, and and uh, just have lived in different places for various personal reasons and always got jobs in public radio and ended up in education reporting sort of by accident um, back in 2007, 2008. And have realized um, that I landed in and that, that this is something that I care passionately about and that all the different things that sort of drew me to journalism without really knowing it and kept me in journalism are things that you can explore really deeply and really well in education. And there are things about equity and opportunity and questions about sort of research and how research affects policy or not. That's always been really interesting to me. And I've just always been, I've also been really interested in how people learn too. That's just been something that I've been, that even before I became an education reporter, I think I was thinking about a lot. Wow. That's so, you know, that's so interesting. So, so kind of connect some dots for me. You know, I, I just recently uh, re-listened to your latest um, 
piece, um, what the words say. And you, you do such a wonderful job of really connecting the issues of equity and literacy instruction and education in general. So kind of go back to what you said about yourself and that perception of yourself um, as having some privilege and then how you, you know, ended up in education reporting and how you blend those, those ideas together for us. Because I think that's really such, you do such a wonderful job of that. Thank you. Mm. Let's see, what's the answer to that question? I mean, I, you know, when I was, when I was hired um, to cover education back in 2008 at American Public Media, um, the very first project I did actually was about early education. It was about preschool. But then after that, almost all of the stuff I did was really about um, more at the sort of post-secondary level and preparation for post-secondary, because I was really interested in these questions of what education can do for people and how, you know, um, how and how it can be a force for equity and why it's not more of one potentially. And the question of whether people are prepared for education after college. Um, and what happened is that it, several years ago, I was doing a piece that was about precisely that. It was about the very large number of students who end up in these remedial or developmental education classes when they go to college. And I met a whole lot of people who told me about their struggles with reading. And I, and it's in particular, one woman who told me she had dyslexia and I didn't know anything about dyslexia. And this woman had never been evaluated in any kind of uh, formal way that she knew of. She had sort of self-identified as someone with dyslexia. And she just told me this extraordinary story of just how difficult reading was for her, how no one really ever taught her how to do it, how she figured out ways to get through school and do okay and graduate from college. And she really wanted to be a nurse and she was super persistent about it. And she was from, so she has from a family background that was kind of troubled and they didn't have a lot of money and there was no one there to sort of really notice or help her with the problems that she was having. She had a, an older sister who really kind of did a lot of the reading for her um, and, and had she memorized a whole lot of stuff, like the amount of stuff that she was able to just memorize. And she just told me this extraordinary story and I just, I, I didn't know anything about dyslexia and I got really interested in the question of just learning disabilities writ large whether or not the part of our problem with all these people going into remedial education in college were was under identified unidentified learning disabilities that hadn't been you know dealt with well and then I you know quickly learned that of course the absolutely most common learning disability is reading and quickly you know quick quickly got, got very interested in dyslexia and understanding what that is but very quickly, really through dyslexia advocates, was really introduced to this gigantic body of research on reading, which I really didn't know. I mean, I guess I knew a little bit about it, but I didn't, I'd never really dug into it. I didn't really know much about it. And it just, it became very clear in that reporting on dyslexia that, that people who have dyslexia, which is a question, obviously, we know that learning abilities, you know, reading abilities on this continuum, and um, that the kids who are really struggling with reading in school are like sort of canaries in the coal mine that we have this larger problem where all kids are not sort of being consistently taught in a way that's going to add up to them becoming good readers we just leave too much to chance because the instruction is not grounded in what we know uh, about how what skilled reading is just what it is <laughs> how it develops and then what's wrong when people struggle and so when kids are struggling with reading in school, I think a lot of the problem is that the teachers themselves, and this is not their fault, haven't been taught what they really should know um, about reading and how it works. So they don't really understand what's up when kids are struggling. And so they, they don't really know what to do about it. And this cycle where they're sort of like waiting for it all to come together like magic. And for some kids it does, and for a lot of kids it doesn't. Yeah. And you know, you, you bring up an interesting, when you talked about the, the woman who, um, you know, wanted to be the nurse and, and how she had kind of compensated, you know, throughout her schooling. Her sister read to her, she kind of, you know, made her way through. I think that happens a lot more than we know. Um, students who, you know, look like readers, sound like readers, act like readers, are, are really compensating for not really having that deep neural system that allows them to, you know, to really get that text off the page. Yes, quickly, efficiently, 
deeply. That is one of the things that's been very moving to me in, the res in response to the reporting that I've done is I hear from struggling readers all the time. And they, they tell me about how they've kept it secret, all the ways that they hide it, the shame that they have, but also the extraordinary ways that they can be very successful. Anyway, you know, they, they memorize the words they need to know. And you can be sort of in a set, you know, very, very intelligent, very um, uh, people who've been very, very successful um, can really learn what they need to know. I mean, scientists in certain fields learn the, 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 the words they need to know for their field. This woman, Sarah, learned all the phrases and things she needed to know about nursing. She, told me she, she eventually got out of that remedial class. She almost didn't. I mean, that was almost the end of college for her. A professor saw that she was really bright and really motivated, but she just couldn't, couldn't read very well and she really couldn't spell at all and figured out a way to get her through. And she talks about, she got her nursing degree without really cracking a book. She just like, she can memorize a lot of stuff and she, she did what she needed to know, but it's taxing and tiring. And, if she, and, and, and she feels ashamed about it. And she's limited in some of the things that she can do in her life, you know? And so she's in this incredible success story. And yet, if someone had taught her some, basic things about written language, she'd be in a better spot today. It doesn't necessarily mean she'd be like a great reader, right? But she could know so much more. She could understand so much more about the English spelling system, for example, which is just a complete mystery to her. It's a complete mystery to a lot of people because we don't teach it to them when they're five and six. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, it, and it's interesting because I, I think about, um, that's a heartbreaking story. I mean, it's a success story, but it's also a heartbreaking story, you know? Um, so, so when we think about, you know, I, I know your work has really struck a chord with people like her, people who struggle to read. Um, who else do you think has really been um, deeply moved by the work that you've put out there? You know, I mean, I think that this work has gotten a lot of response because this is really like a problem hiding in plain sight. Um, so I have heard from a lot of parents, like I said, they were really the ones who, um, showed me this story initially, but I think the other group of people that are very moving for me to hear from, and I hear from all the time are teachers, because I think that this sort of all the debates and disagreements about reading have really, um, teachers have sort of have sort of been sometimes cast as or sort of has, they're they're sort of like collateral damage in it all somehow and they they get blamed or they feel blamed um and i think what what happens is that when the, so many teachers in this country are either not really taught much at all about reading when they're in their teacher preparation programs or they're taught or sort of pick up a kind of collection of ideas that turn out not to be quite right and that sort of lead them astray. Uh, we have so many of, and, and, and so many people, as you know, kind of go into teacher prep and they're taught a bunch of different theories and different things about reading and they sort of choose their own approach, their own philosophy, what works best for them, what works best for their kids. And so, so many teachers, some of them really see it right away. They like come out of teacher preparation and they're assigned to teach first grade and they realize, oh my God, I don't know anything about how to teach reading. <laughs> yeah. And other teachers think, well, I'm gonna take all the stuff I did learn and I'm gonna apply it and you know, do as well as I can. But, but most teachers I think in this country um, who have not been introduced to the scientific research on reading and how to apply that, and as we know, translating them to practice is much harder than just learning it. Um, when they start to learn about it, it's just these huge aha moments for them. Like, oh, right. And they see their own students from the past. They see the kids who struggled. They're like, if I had only done that, or, oh, that, what was, I think that's what was going on with that kid. And they feel guilt, which is awful, you know? And so I think it's just that it's, it, it, this is not the teacher's fault. Teachers aren't being taught this stuff, and they're being taught stuff that's incorrect. And um, they, teachers who learn this stuff are really, really grateful. But it's a problem because when teachers do learn it, they, they, when they really dig in and learn this stuff, they realize how much there is to learn. There's so much to learn, which I think is the biggest challenge we face, um, is, that, 
that really teaching teachers what they need to know about this stuff to teach little kids how to read well, there's a lot for teachers to know. And our whole teacher preparation system isn't really set up to train teachers very well or very long for much of anything. So there's a, there's a long way to go. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, and I feel that way. I, I reflect on my own coming up as a teacher and um, you know, when I came up as a teacher, there were, you know, we were taught a lot of different activities to do with kids and, um, you know, multiple kind of ideas around reading. And, and I always think about this, you know, ideas around reading, but not how do children acquire the ability to read and how does instruction match that? Um, that's the part that I think is, is really missing. And I really appreciate that you're bold, you know, in your reporting when you say many teachers were taught something that is incorrect, and you know your second, um, your second uh, reporting the flawed idea teaching millions of kids to be poor readers, uh, that really was um, again bold, I think, and I'm guessing that you probably had so much response to that one in particular, because the flawed idea that you called out is one that is pervasive in both teacher preparation and practice yeah it's kind of i i, I it, it's sort of like this elephant in the room kind of i guess that's what that piece did it's like no one really wants to like name names or say the thing that it is and um and so yeah i mean i i, I so i because i think I think these debates about reading have gotten kind of stuck in this fight about phonics, honestly, right? And, and, and phonics is sort of one piece of it, and there's plenty to talk about in, in terms of phonics, like how to teach it and all the other things that kids really need to know to understand their written language, which is really the message that I'm trying to deliver. This is not about phonics instruction. It's about the fact that when a little kid comes to school, they know how to say a lot of words, and they don't know how to read and write them yet. And they need to learn. <laughs> they they need to they 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 need to figure out how their written language works to access that. It's something different. And as we know, it, it it's a it's a different process. And 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 a lot of kids need explicit teaching. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think I think there's just a um, you know I, I think the the arguments about phonics have distracted us because now it enables people to say, yes, I'm for phonics and here's some phonics. And number one, we need to have more better conversations about phonics instruction itself. And number two, it allows everything else to stay in place. And it's almost like what really needs to happen, I think in schools is almost like a, like a time use audit, like go in to elementary classrooms and in your literacy block, which in a lot of schools is an hour or 90 minutes or two hours, or there's two blocks a day, <laughs> We spend a lot of time teaching kids how, how to read, but like you said, what we really do is there's a bunch of activities and processes and systems to move kids around and you give them a little bit of, you give them a little bit of independent reading and a little bit of guided reading, a little bit of phonics instruction, a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and like it adds up to readers and that does add up to reading for some kids. For some kids, right. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and the I think problem that, is that yeah. I tried to point out in this most recent piece when you're sort of like you give them a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and when it doesn't equal reading, two things happen. You either say, "Well, that kid must have some kind of disability, right?" Okay, so we need kid needs special ed, or that kid is from sort of a, a some sort of impoverished environment. They weren't read to enough. The parents aren't paying attention, and the and parents are told all the time, "Just read more to your kid." That reading to kids is absolutely great and really important and builds a foundation for good reading. But a kid who's struggling to learn how to read in first grade, you could read to that kid till the cows come home. It's, <laughs> it's right. not going to do it. It's not going to matter. Yeah. I mean, I always, re again, reflecting back on my own experience, which, you know, I went to college a long time ago, but I, it's, I still hear from even very young teachers that this is what they're taught as well. You know, that there's a parallel between learning to read and learning to speak. And that if we model and immerse kids in print and let them explore print, that somehow all of this is going to come together. And again, if we learn to read maybe that way or we don't remember explicit instruction, we, we think that that is real for most kids, if not all kids. Um, so kind of breaking through that, and, and I think that's what's really important. But you bring up something else that I think is really critical when you said that you know teachers 
when they're availed to this information, which they don't necessarily get in their teacher preparation, there's this sense of why didn't I learn this? And they reflect on all these students and there is a sense of guilt and there is a sense of, you know, how do I make up for that? Um, and I'm sure you see that uh, in your work. I do. Yeah. I do. And I, and I, you know, and I hear from teachers at all grade levels too. So I hear from like those kindergarten and first, second grade teachers, but I hear from middle school teachers and high school teachers a lot who two things, either they've like kind of like always known they had these kids who weren't reading and like what's going on in the early grades or, or they're sort of getting introduced to this whole science of reading thing and having different ahas about what's really going on with their kids. Like finally realizing they have these kids who really don't read, they're, they're, they read, but it's sort of halting and slow and not very fluent. And what we know from the reading research is those kids have not orthographically mapped all those words to their mind. There's, there's, there's something that's really missing in terms of their understanding of the structure of language. Um, and as we know, you know, as I've really tried to point out in this most recent piece, this stuff just like accumulates so quickly. So this is why it's so incredibly important to get this right in kindergarten and first grade, because you've got the, the kids who get good instruction and or basically get it. There's one group of kids who get it and they're just like off and running. And then there's this other not small group of kids who are not. And what happens is that the primary task of your first task in school when you're a little kid is learning how to read. And if that is confusing to you, if that is not coming together, it gets in the way of so many other things. It starts to impede your ability to keep up in other classes. It starts to affect your feelings about school in general. School, you don't like school. I mean, the number of parents that I've talked to who talk about how they have first graders and second graders who throw fits and they won't get on the school bus and they want to come home sick and they talk about wanting to die when they're eight years old because they can't read. And I've heard that from so many, so many kids. Um, and that is just, I mean, that is just unfathomable. I mean, it's, it's heartbreaking. Um, yeah. And I think about, you know, a five-year-old starts school, you know, eager to learn to read and eager to learn to write. And, and, you know, one thing you said that I think is really important because teachers want to deliver on that promise, right? They want that for their students. And, and so when you say that this is, you know, this is not the teacher's fault, this is just not something that they were prepared um, to, to do, I think that's a really important point that you make. Um, another point that I really love that you make is, you know, this isn't about phonics. And sometimes people, you know, add phonics, you know, to their existing program. And it isn't about adding phonics. It's about what are we doing in the whole, right? How are those pieces being integrated and how are we doing that for students so that they see how unlocking the alphabetic code leads them into print and then how phonic decoding leads them into orthographic mapping and how that automaticity leads them into fluency, right? I mean, how do we, and so it kind of comes back to how do we help teachers understand that process that readers go through so they can make those instructional decisions every day. You know, I think one of the larger tensions here that needs more attention is that the, the, the bigger argument in reading instruction is not really as much anymore about phonics versus no phonics. It is, it is really about direct teaching versus a more constructivist approach, right? And so what we know from a lot of the scientific research on reading is that one of the, the unifying thing that it calls for as effective is direct and explicit teaching. And we are, we, we are a nation that is really very fond of something else, not direct explicit teaching. Um, and that in, in fact, I think a lot of people have really, a lot of teachers are really taught to believe that that's not good for kids, that it's much better to put them in an environment where they discover, discover things. Discover and explore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And discovery and exploration is great. But I think one of the things that's sort of misunderstood in education is the difference, sort of the difference between being a novice and being an expert. What does someone who's a novice at something need to know to become an expert? What we know is a lot of the stuff that's so popular in schools about discovery learning and hands-on learning, it's, it's not like we should take all of, it's not like we don't let kids do that. But the point is that when you don't know about anything, you need a grounding in the thing before you're really going to get a lot out of the discovery and discover things for yourself. So if you become a, a really good reader at a young 
age, a lot of the routines that are in place in reading instruction would work much better once kids are sort of expert in the basics of, this can apply to science education too. I mean, there's a lot of stuff that happens in science education in the name of letting kids explore things for themselves. And what we know from the research is like kids need to learn some basic things so that they have those aha moments in their explorations rather than confusion. And I think that's what's happening. It's just like a lot of kids are coming to school and the way that they're taught to read is confusing. They just don't know what to make of it and they can't add it all up and they don't have the extra support at home to make it all add up. But we know that some kids really do kind of get taught by their parents or if there's really a struggle going on, those parents pay for tutoring or they they, they figure out a way to make it work. And this is why this is really an equity issue. Because if we don't teach kids how to read, it's the kids who don't have an option outside of school who suffer the most. We should be teaching all kids to read in school, rich, poor, what, white, black, whatever. But some kids are okay in the end, no matter what their schools do. And some kids are really, really dependent on what their school does for them. Well, and I'm glad you brought that up because that, you know, you, I see such a clear connection between reading instruction, reading achievement, and equitable access to high quality education. And this makes this such a compelling, you know, social justice issue. And that really comes through in your work. And I think that's a really important thing for us to, to really reckon with. You know? I agree. And I, I think it's really important for, um, yeah, I think it's really important to acknowledge that um, and to really see. I think our, I think that the, the, the pro, one of the problems writ large um, is that we, we have to sort of like flip the script. Like the assumption about reading instruction is that most kids will be okay and some kids will need a lot of direct teaching and it's the opposite. Some kids do not need much direct teaching, but a whole lot of kids do. And the other thing, of course, is that good direct teaching by a teacher who really understands the English language is going to help kids be better spellers. I can't tell you how many people tell me that they're good readers, but they can't really spell. And you realize, well, you're missing out a lot on how English works. You really are. Um, right. Yeah. And I, and I think that spelling to me is one of the windows into if a child is struggling, right? Because we talked about kids who can compensate as readers. Um, but a lot of times then we look at their spelling and is their spelling commensurate with that reading? And sometimes that's a really, uh, when it's a window to understanding that there is a, there is a struggle there. Um, so I think that is worthy of attention as well. You know, when I, when I think about, um, you know, you mentioned that struggling readers that you really strike a chord and with teachers, what kind of pushback do you get, um, from your reporting? Well, I mean, there's certainly, certainly some teachers feel blamed. I mean, some, some teachers, I, I think I've been very careful in my reporting not to do that. And I've heard from many teachers who recognize that and appreciate it, but it's inevitable that this is going to feel um, like they're being blamed. I think that's, I, I, I think that's one of the ways that just human beings also deal with things that are hard or that those initial feelings of, you know, guilt. Um, you know, I think the pushback comes from people who have who are invested in the status quo for some reason and i don't even i'm not i'm not saying that in some sort of evil intent but there are some people who have who who have found success with the way that they or they think they have with the way that they're reading so they you know and it it, it may be that they have it may be that they're in a school that is tilted towards a lot of kids who are going to do okay no matter what like some people are in schools like that some teachers don't realize how much help some of their kids are getting outside of school um, you know, some people, some people have made their careers on, um, you know, writing papers and producing curriculum and doing things that are, um, you know, that don't align very well with the scientific research. Um, you know, there's a, there's a big industry in the United States around professional development and curriculum material. Curriculum materials, no question. And it's a big old ocean of stuff yeah. that is not particularly well aligned with the science of reading and is not aligned with the idea of direct and explicit teaching. And exactly. And there are a lot of curricular resources out there that are predominant in the marketplace, right? That do not align to any of this. And that's something that I think really needs to, again, to be reckoned with um, in this discussion. You know, I want to go back to what you were mentioning about the, you know, the constructivism and this idea 
you know, the kids learn best through exploration and discovery versus explicit instruction. Um, do you also think that there's kind of a social political aspect to that? Yes, absolutely. But I think that the social political aspect is very complicated. So the very simple version is sort of like a conservative versus liberal or progressive or, you know, it, that's a very simple thing. And, and, and certainly that's a charge that's been put at people who've come out for the science of reading or explicit instruction in particular. They're traditionalists, they're conservatives. Conservatives. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But when you, you know, but that turns out not to be true. So certainly there are some sort of conservatives who are, but there are, plenty, there are plenty of people in the reading research world who I think are very liberal on many things, politically speaking. And what they've done is looked at the body of evidence on, on, on educational approaches, which really shows a lot of evidence for direct instruction. <laughs> we had this huge meta-analysis of direct instruction a couple of years ago. There's really nothing else in education that's so well proven but only of like a very small percentage of schools teach that way. So people who've looked at the body of evidence come out for a certain way of doing things. And, you know, people, it's just, it goes so against the ocean of what is sort of accepted in education. No one, uh, you know, they think it's telling teachers what to do. And, you know, and, and, you know, teachers are taught too in their teacher preparation that they're supposed to design their own curriculum and make up their own lessons. And we know that in a lot of schools, what's really happening is a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And the teacher really planning her mostly own lessons and going to Google and teachers pay teachers. And think about it with the extraordinary amount of work that is. But we've just, teachers have come to accept somehow. I actually remember when I was sort of trying to figure out what to do with my life. And I had a lot of friends who went into Teach for America in the very early days of Teach for America. And I remember sort of observing their experience and they were put into some very challenging situations with very little training. And I don't know that I would have known how to say it then, but I think the thing that I really realized is they weren't really given anything to teach, like what, what to teach. And in this country, we, we really are, we're really agnostic on the what in so many ways. And we know from the science of reading, this gets us into political conversations because these are political choices when it comes down to what content you're going to teach kids. Um, and, the, and these are, these, you know, there's so much evidence on the side of certain things. But at the end of the day, it, it, like, there, there's no way to do education without making choices that are sort of political in nature, moral in nature, you know, like you, if you, if you want a school that's sort of designed in a constructivist approach, what we know is that there's a lot of evidence to do it in a different way, but that could be a choice that people make. If people pay a lot of money for private schools that are set up that way. People, I live in Washington, D.C., and they pay many, many thousands of dollars a year because that's what they want their kids in, you know, but when we're talking about public education and public dollars, we need to be looking at what we know works. But I think that gets us to the hard, one of the hardest parts of this whole science of reading thing, which is like really identifying places that have made it work. There are so many pieces that it's not like you go in, you do the science of reading for two years and suddenly you're, all the kids read really well. I mean, first of all, our NAEP scores aren't aligned to any particular curriculum or content, right? And so that's part of our problem is we're sort of chasing this weird end where um, we have, we're not willing to make a decision. And I'm not saying we should, this is a political choice, but we haven't been willing in this country to make a decision that there's certain stuff we want all kids to know. We're going to teach them that stuff and test them on that stuff. But it's, it's really led us astray. Um, yeah. You know, it's interesting. I was, I was speaking to a, a younger teacher recently and she, she, she said, you know, I, I came out of teacher prep thinking that I was supposed to know all this, you know, that I was, when I went into the classroom, that I was given choice and autonomy and that that was a good thing and that I wasn't supposed to, you know, I, or that's, this is how she felt, her perception. You know, I was supposed to know and I was supposed to be able to make all these choices as an autonomous educator in a classroom. Um, and I said, yeah, you know, I, I, I think that's really pervasive, this idea that teacher autonomy um, is really important. But I think that puts an unfair burden on teachers a lot of times, right? Like, like somehow I'm supposed, to figure, I'm supposed to figure this all out. 
Exactly. And all, the way we do teacher prep in this country, maybe you've had two, the last, your last two years of college, or maybe you went to a one-year preparation program, right? And then you're in a classroom. It's an, it's an impossible thing that we're asking teachers to do. And we, we don't pay teachers enough. We don't respect them enough. And yet this idea that they have to plan all their lessons and be autonomous means they spend all their weekends lesson planning. They spend their nights lesson planning. And you know, some of the people that point out these more, these curriculum is the teachers learn the curriculum and they deliver those lessons, you know, and, and it takes a lot of the burden. They are not curriculum designers. Instructional design is not their thing. You know, but it's difficult because any one curriculum includes all kinds of different choices, right? About, exactly. uh, about well, what to teach kids. They exactly. And I think that, um, I also think there's a, I mean, I, I kind of felt this way as a beginning teacher that there was some publisher out there that had all good intentions and they had this team of experts that were putting together a program that was based on the evidence and that was solid instruction for kids. And so again, reckoning with that, that these instruction materials aren't necessarily coming from a place that really draws on the evidence base. Um, and, and even I, if it did, there's probably never going to be a perfect curriculum, right? No, there no. Isn't. And so I think the, 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 the sort of twist in this whole conversation is that I do think at the end of the day, it does come down to teacher knowledge and not necessarily, auto and, and some kind of autonomy. Like at the end of the day, it's really about what the teachers know about reading and the English language and what's going on when kids struggle. And I think that's one of the problems even of trying to chase some perfect curriculum because any curriculum is as good as how well it's implemented, and how well the teachers understand. And I think, I think what a lot of people like you have learned is there's a lot of different curriculum that can work in the hands of a knowledgeable teacher. Skilled teacher. A I'm skilled sorry. teacher, and a skilled teacher can know what things in a curriculum not to use. You know, so like there are some curriculum that, you know, some people will say to me, that curriculum is terrible. And other people will say, I think it's great. And I think it's all about how it gets used, which is why it becomes very ha hard to like measure this stuff, right? Like school A implements this curriculum and school B implements this. And can you connect that to reading outcomes? There's so much that happens in the middle. Plus we know that around half of the kids, it doesn't really matter how you teach them anyway. It doesn't matter, right? Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. I know, yeah. It's so difficult to kind of prove this stuff and to yeah. show it. Mm -hmm. you and, know, yet, and, and yet it's very convincing. To, the thing that I think is very compelling to me about this topic is the science, the basic scientific research itself is very compelling to many teachers when they learn it because it is so different from what they've learned and it does provoke a lot of thought. It does resonate when they hear about the basic science of reading. They see that, they, they see that is what is going on in my kids' minds. Um, and it's, it's really empowering and, um, and they want more. And, and I, I agree with you. And I, I know that when I speak to groups of teachers and I, and I talk about this robust body of evidence, you know, over 40 years, and when I mention it's the most studied aspect of human learning, these are big ahas for teachers. Um, so it does kind of go back to, you know, how are we preparing teachers? And, and the myriad decisions that teachers make every day, um, you know, yes, she's got these, these resources, curriculum resources, but she has to make decisions every day on how to use that. And so if the through line or the underpinning um, of her teacher preparation is understanding how children learn to read, she can make those decisions based on that knowledge, right? Yeah. And it is so ironic when you say to teachers that it's the most studied aspect of human learning because there's this weird situation, I think, within schools, like parents definitely go through this when their kid is struggling or whatever, where there's almost this like, we don't, we don't really know. It's sort of a mystery. Like, how do kids, how do kids really learn how to read? I think that's, I think that ends up being sort of like the, the message in schools or teachers are like, I'm doing everything I was told and it's not adding up for some kids. So I, I, it's just a mystery. And then when they realize this is so studied and we know so much and so much of this stuff is settled um, in the scientific community, uh, that's a you know, big aha for them. But I, I know, as you know, in the reading league, the question of translating it into practice is a whole other thing. And that's not necessarily like, proven or figured out. <laughs> yeah, that's, and that's the gap, right? Is how do we bridge, you know, that knowledge into practice? That's really the gap, yeah. You know, um, 
I, as I mentioned in the opening, you know, I think I'm, I'm, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm just deeply grateful because I feel like you really elevated the conversation around reading instruction, around teacher preparation. Um, do you think we're making any progress since your first report when you look back over the, over this uh, last few years? It's really hard for me to know, obviously. I mean, there's, I think there's a lot of conversation going on. I mean, I think there's a national conversation going on. I don't think that's just because of my reporting. I think I came along and did the reporting because, like I said earlier, it was a problem hiding in plain sight. It's already because a whole lot of people, parents, researchers, teachers who've learned this science, right? There's, a, a, there's been a whole bunch of people for a, quite a long time. We know that decade, people have been fighting for this for a very, you know, been trying to bring this to schools for a long time. But I think maybe it's like having, like, I think maybe like enough forces are coming together. I mean, I think, um, I think a big tipping point at all really is the parents. I think the parents and then also the teachers, because a lot of teachers are parents too. And as you know, a lot of teachers come to their big aha moments when they've been teaching first grade for five years and then they have a kid who can't read and they realize, I don't know how to teach her how to read. And they think, what kind of a first grade? I mean, I have, I have so many teachers have broken down in tears. Oh, I totally agreed. Yeah. But it's when, so I think the most powerful actors in all of this who potentially have the power to really tip the scales against a, a, a kind of research community and a, and a publishing community and sort of a public policy community that sometimes is tilted a different way, right? There's like a big Titanic of all that stuff. And then there's parents and teachers who are a powerful force saying like, my kid can't read, my kid can't read, my kid can't read. Um, so, you know, I think there's a lot of conversation going on and I think that's great. And I think my reporting has helped distill some of this stuff for people. Um, but you know, it's always a delicate moment when conversation like this is going on, right? Because conversation has gone on about this at a sort of a national level many times before. And I think in some ways we're in the position we're in because there's sort of been like an action reaction to things that have happened you know, different kinds of federal and state efforts to codify this stuff and impose it. And then there's a big reaction against it. A lot of what we see out there that's sort of popular in the world of reading materials are companies and people who've come along to sort of say like, we're not big bad publishers. We're not, we're on your side. They speak the language of teachers. Um, they know uh, they know what they want, and and, and but they're but they're selling some ideas about reading that really aren't adding up for a lot of kids. Right, exactly. Yeah. So, um, so what are your hopes for the work that you've done so far? Like, what do you what do you really hope will happen next? What's kind of the next step? Well, in my work in particular, or the or the uh, yeah. Well, I mean, I'm I'm hoping to stay on this topic for a long time. I feel like there is. There are years of reporting left to do to, to really just actually document what's happening. I feel like what I've been able to do as a reporter is um, sort of ex some basic sort of explanatory journalism, kind of explaining the science to people and sort of showing what's wrong. I would really love to be able to document more of what's happening <laughs> over time. And I also really would like to, um, I'd really like to sort of better understand like how this happened. Like, how did we end up here? How did it happen that there's 40, 50 years of scientific research on something and so many teachers don't know about it? Um, and part of the answer to that is that like findings from scientific research don't make the, their way into the real world that easily all over the place. Like we know that this is difficult, there's resistance. Um, but I, I guess that's, I would like to better understand that as a journalist. Um, that happened because I think that's an important part of understanding how it maybe can not happen again. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know, I was talking to Tim Shanahan about this and he was uh, saying that of the, of the professions that you see out there, you know, teaching is a unique profession in that we don't necessarily um, bring our teachers up to understand research, you know, and to understand effect size and, quantitative versus qualitative. Um, and so really helping teachers understand and discern, you know, what is evidence, because I'm, I'm sure you heard this in your reporting, and I hear this a lot when I speak to groups of teachers. Well, you know, Laura, you can make, you know, research say whatever you want. Um, and so that's part of that. I think that's part of the piece when you mentioned science, 
that is some sometimes intimidating to people when that should be part of a professional preparation in a in an in a profession in which there is a body of evidence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 No, I know. I mean, and I, you know, I, 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 you know, I, I think that's our larger world too. Like we are, we live in a time as human beings where we actually know a lot about a lot of things. And yet we live in a world where people are sort of can have their own opinions about stuff and kind of go find the evidence that they want for their opinions about things. And it's, it's sort of scary, the world that we live in, in terms of, like holding on to what we actually, you know, what's actually known. And, um, you know, knowledge is a contested thing always. Um, and, you know, obviously that's one of the biggest, you asked earlier about pushback um, to the work. And I, you know, I, I think this general question of sort of like my science, your science kind of thing. Um, and it's true. I mean, I think, I think what's happened is that there's been a huge amount of research on reading that has largely not been done in schools of education. Um, it's been done by cognitive scientists. Science, and psychology, okay. right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Oh. And, um, and it, 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 for, for people in schools of education, it feels like a little bit of an incursion, an invasion. You know, like we've been doing this other, it's not like the, a lot of the stuff that's been going on in schools of education has been valuable for other reasons. It's just that a lot of the stuff that's been done around reading and early reading instruction turns out to be at odds with some of the stuff in cognitive science. And you do have to kind of weigh the evidence and think like, okay, there's a really big weight of evidence over here on the stuff that these cognitive scientists have figured out. It's time for the education, school of education research to be affected by that. Right, right. And, and I mean, you even see evidence of how those two departments don't even speak to one another, don't even, you know, like come together to, to merge their, their understandings. So, yeah. So Emily, what are you working on now? Well, um, I, I am, uh, uh, I am hoping to do more of this reporting, uh, trying to get to answer some questions about sort of why and how I'm not quite sure how I'm doing that yet. Um, and I, I, I really would like to continue this work for many years to come. So I'm working on trying to sort of establish, uh, you know, tell APM how much there is to do here, how much more work can be done. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that there'll be, there'll be more projects to come. These things take a long time. <laughs> I've got a couple of other people working with me now. I was doing a lot of this as a reporter. I was really solo. We've actually hired a couple of more reporters who are working with me now. Um, and so we've got, uh, we've got some ideas for some, for a big project that we're working on that, you know, in a year or so. Fantastic. People will hear about. <laughs> okay, well, we can't wait to hear about that because, like I said, we're just so appreciative of, of the work you've done so far. Um, so there's one niggling question that's just been kind of rolling around in my head. When you talked about how you left college with one semester to go <laughs> um, and you just did a lot of reading, was there anything in particular that you read that was really impactful that you can name? Oh wow! Or just do a lot of just do a lot of different reading. I think I was really reading. God, I, like like I'm struggling to come up with a title of a book. <laughs> um, I don't know. I don't know from that period of my life. I, a lot was going on with me emotionally. So like I don't even know if I have very good memories of that period of my life. Um, yeah. But but, so, uh, but but nonetheless, you said it was the best the best decision you made, right? Yeah, because when I went back to college, I really got so much out of it. I ended up actually being off for a year and a half. And then I just had one semester left. And I just knew what I wanted out of my education at that point. And that's like, a, that's a long time to like, finally be like, I know what I want out of my education now. Um, as I, you know, I, I, feel, I feel like college is often wasted on the young, you know, on 18 exactly. year olds. Exactly, right, right. right. Yeah. A lot of money to send 18 year olds to college. And I think I know. some 18 year olds really know how to get a lot out of it, but I didn't. Um, so it just, I, I, I appreciated the sort of intellectual endeavor and um, yeah, just got so much more out of it when I went yeah, back. That's great. And then I never even went to graduate school. <laughs> yeah, well, and I think that, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm really grateful you took that time because it led you to where you are now. And that's, um, that's kind of how I, I always kind of frame decisions like that around, you know, if you hadn't made that decision, you wouldn't be where you are now, right? In those big life decisions. So well, thank you for this. This has just been a, a great conversation. I, I wish we could go on and on because there's so much more to say, but I, I really appreciate um, your reporting. I appreciate what you bring out there to the world for those of us in education. Um, and I appreciate your, um, the articulate way in which you're able to express these ideas, these big ideas around reading instruction. So thank you for that. Um, but I do want to end with some uh, rapid fire questions here. Uh -oh. So here we go. Um, 
Who was your favorite teacher growing up and why? I had, a, I had <laughs> several, probably Mrs. Stanley. She was my seventh and eighth grade <clears throat> English teacher. And <clears throat> she was, <clears throat> what I remember about her, she was one of the first people who really introduced me to content. We read Shakespeare, Faulkner, Carson McCullers. Like I remember really reading, and I was, a, I, was a, I was an English major in college, and I feel like I think I read more sort of good classic books with Mrs. Stanley. And we read a lot and then I remember and we wrote a ton and I and you know obviously I, I was I was a really we had these journals and we were just it, we every night we just had to write and I would write and write and write in response to what we were reading she would give us prompts we would just write personal things she would go through there so it was like and then you know she taught us how to diagram sentences oh yeah and I loved it I, I loved know. it so much I know um yeah. so it was like Mrs. Stanley kind of gave me when I think about it now, like sort of all the things you need, like I got this rich content, she had us write and write and write and write and write. And I got this like structured instruction. I learned how to, I really learned a lot about English grammar from set. And I know, I know a lot of people say there's not, you know, there's no evidence behind uh, diagramming sentences, but it was good for me. That's so funny. Cause I loved that too. And you know, it, a good middle school teacher is like the best, right? And I, I had the same experience. I had a middle school teacher, and she read aloud Greek mythology. Yes, we read aloud. And it was amazing. And then we also did a lot of sentence diagramming, which I love too. So I, I totally can relate to that. Um, okay, name a favorite book, um, either as a child or as an adult. A favorite. Notice I say a favorite, not yeah, your yeah. favorite, because you, know, I mean, you probably have a lot. One of the things that I discuss, that I like, so one of the things I, I realize in like life now. So I like really in my life, I've loved fiction so much. And I d almost like don't have the headspace for fiction anymore. I can read it when I'm on vacation. So like I just was on vacation and I read a few novels, but like I read a few novels every year and it's when I'm, I'm on vacation. But what I do remember when I was a kid, I'm old enough that I, you know, was pre-internet, pre-computers, all that, just how much I would just get sucked into books. And I really did read a ton as a kid. <laughs> but the thing, the, the books that I remember the most, I really wanted those like page turners. Like I was that kind of kid who was walking down the street with like a book. And I remember, uh, do you remember the um, Flowers in the Attic? Do you remember? Oh them? my gosh, yes. <laughs> Trashy, <laughs> horrible books. Would you, uh, yeah, those are the books I remember because there were like a whole bunch of them and they were, they were horrible. It's like these four kids were locked up in an attic of their like wealthy <laughs> grandparents and there was like incest and abuse and it was. Yeah, very, but they were really popular, very, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I remember reading those. Oh my gosh, that's so funny. Yeah, and the page turners. I, I was that kid too. I was the kid who walked down the hall, you know, stumbling because I had the book in front of me. I totally get that. Yeah. Um, what are you reading right now? You mentioned going on vacation, reading some fiction. What are you reading right now? Uh, well, I just, I just read a nice novel. I have it here. Fever by Mary Beth Kane. It's a novel about typhoid Mary. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Given oh, interesting. Together. Okay. Um, I've been reading this book, uh, Robert Caro, who wrote this huge, um, uh, he wrote, he's written this epic thing about Lyndon B. Johnson. And he's just written this short memoir, which is about researching, interviewing, and writing. And it's just interesting, sort of reflective for my life. And um, yes, and then I just, you know, there was that, I mentioned before that there was that big um, meta-analysis about direct instruction a few years ago. And the people who um, did that just wrote this book called All Students Can Succeed. It's about 50 years of research on direct instruction, and it's really good. So I just read that, I just read that whole book this weekend. Awesome. Great. Okay. So, so three recommendations from uh, Emily Hanford. Um, what do you have on your desk that symbolizes you or that is dear to you? Well, I have, um, I have these things taped up on the bookshelf next to me and I just realized I have a whole bunch of things. They're like a watercolor that my mom made and Aww. quotes and stuff. Yeah. But I have two things from my kids. I have this little poem that my youngest son made for me. He was probably in like second grade or something and it's a little picture of me and he says it's a poem that starts for mom cute and mindful funny and nice I wish I could take you out to dinner <laughs> and it keeps going so I don't know this is my cute little son that is adorable son. oh my gosh and then the other one that which that's been funny I haven't read this in a while but when my older son went to college he's a junior in college now someone gave me this New Yorker cartoon and it says 
I've been a mess since Jake left for college. So now we have a boy who comes in a couple of times a week to leave wet towels all over and challenge everything <laughs> I say. <laughs> and the funny thing about that is that my, my uh, older son is, um, he leaves wet towels everywhere. And he went away to college, but now he's back. And 20 years old and he's actually like he's working a job and he's very mature in so many ways but oh my god are there wet towels all over oh that? my gosh you know <laughs> spoken like a true mother of boys yes yeah i know when uh, when my son uh left home the one thing that was missing was the smell of socks yeah <laughs> right right um okay and um last question what are your greatest hopes for for today's children I mean, I really do hope that this conversation happening around reading leads to some real change, really sticks, really. We've had these conversations before, but I hope something is different this time. Um, and, you know, I'm really worried about what's, like, I, I, I'm worried about the world right now, this year of instruction and COVID and kids who are going to lose out um, and what and the long-term effects on those on so many kids for so many reasons but the little kids who are kindergartners first and second graders right now what are we going to do as schools and a society to make up for that lost instruction because we know so many of those kids weren't getting that instruction anyway and now they're losing even the uh, in, in some you know and many teachers are doing their darndest but uh, yeah yeah. Zoom is not easy. <laughs> yeah, it, you're exactly right. I, I totally share that as well. Um, well, thank you, Emily, for this wide ranging conversation. And um, I hope we have another opportunity to speak uh, maybe when all of this is over and we're all traveling again and we can be in person. Um, that's, that's a hope that I have. But in the meantime, again, thank you so much. And we really appreciate the work you're putting out there and look forward to your next piece. Thanks. So Thanks great. Time. Thanks for sharing the work. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Emily. Okay. Bye. Right. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks. So thank you so much for listening today. I'm quite sure that you, like me, uh, really enjoyed Emily's insights and her passion. You know, we here at the Reading League are committed to bringing you these important conversations and also to providing you with some valuable resources. So if you haven't already checked us out, please do so, www.thereadingleague.org, and you'll learn about our mission, you'll learn about our knowledge base and the resources that we offer. Um, and we really encourage you to become a member. Also, check out our Facebook group because we have a robust community of educators just like you uh, that want to be involved in sharing insights and learning from one another. So please join us. Um, thank you for tuning in. And uh, we hope to see you next time.